the conference tonight is timely because the situation at present in Northern Ireland in relation to sex education is that sex education is not currently compulsory in primary schools. In post-primary schools, the schools must have an RSE policy, but that policy should be in line with the ethos of the school, should be approved by the school's governing body, and it really ought to be developed in consultation with parents. But if you've been following news over the last couple of weeks, you will have heard last week that the Secretary of State has laid regulations at Westminster which enshrine the recommendations of the UN's CEDAW Committee, which will require compulsory RSE lessons on the legal right to an abortion in Northern Ireland and how relevant services may be accessed. And that is due to take effect in 2024. Also yesterday in the news, the Human Rights Commission issued a report in which they argued that RSE in schools here in Northern Ireland does not meet human rights standards. The Human Rights Commission's report claims that most schools in Northern Ireland are not providing age-appropriate, comprehensive and scientifically accurate education in relation to abortion, contraception and sexual activity. And according to the BBC's analysis of the Human Rights Commission report today, it made a point of saying that two-thirds of post-primary schools in Northern Ireland are promoting abstinence before marriage in their sex education policy. And that was implied as a criticism uh, rather than something that was commendable. The developments have been welcomed by a number of public bodies. Uh, but last month, for those who follow the news, the Education and Training Inspectorate in Northern Ireland has called for schools to deliver more sex education lessons on abortion and gender and sexual identity or sexual ideology. The inspectorate particularly complained that too many schools were completely avoiding teaching on gender identity. It claimed that flexibility given to schools to teach in accordance with their ethos created a risk that some pupils in Northern Ireland could leave school without a clear unbiased knowledge of important concepts such as gender identity. So there's a considerable criticism uh, of schools teaching RSE within their ethos. There are public bodies campaigning against that and there are already changes, legislative changes that will impact that. But in addition to public bodies, there are politicians issuing similar calls. You may or you may not know that Connie Egan, MLA, the Alliance representative for North Down is preparing a private member's bill to set a compulsory RSE curriculum across all schools. So there's considerable pressure at the present time. But tonight we have guest speakers and I want to introduce them and shortly we'll invite them to speak. We have Dr. Tony Rosinski, who represents the Coalition for Marriage, which is the UK's largest pro-marriage organization and Tony has come over from Cardiff to be with us this evening. We're grateful to him for giving of his time. We also have the Reverend Calvin Robinson, a deacon in the Free Church of England and a presenter on GB News, a former school teacher, an assistant principal, a governor, a director and a consultant to the Department for Education. So he's well qualified to address those issues and we want to give them a very warm welcome here to Northern Ireland this evening. So if we can welcome them. Now in a few moments time, I want to hand over to Calvin, who will speak for about 25 minutes. And at the end of his presentation, there will be about five to 10 minutes for questions. Then there'll be a short comfort break and then Dr. Tony Rosinski will speak for about 25 minutes. And again, at the end of that, there will be five to 10 minutes for questions. And then Lucy Marsh will speak for about 10 minutes in relation to the work of the Family Education Trust. Uh, and we'll deal with these each in turn. But I have been asked uh, by Mary Russell just to say a few words 
uh, of introduction about the issue of gender ideology. So RSE is wider than just teaching the issue of gender ideology, but gender ideology is an issue that is coming to the fore at the present time. Obviously, uh, most of us believe that every human being is created as either male or female. Uh, there is a, a worldview going around at the present time that argues that each person has a gender identity that may or may not match with their biological sex. It is claiming that a person's subjective internal feelings of gender are who that person really is and that those subjective internal feelings override the physical biology of our bodies. But of course, the truth is your body is a coherent whole, both body and soul together. But this idea that a person can be trapped in the wrong gender, or as society puts it, that they are transgender, is an ideology that has taken hold in many areas of our nation's life, including the laws of our land. 2004 Gender Recognition Act applies across the UK, including here in Northern Ireland, and there's similar gender recognition legislation in the south of Ireland too, and these laws allow an adult to change sex on all legal documentation, passport, driving license, and even be issued with a birth certificate from the state saying that they were born uh, as either male or female when they were not. And under the terms of the Gender Recognition Act, to obtain one of those gender recognition certificates, an adult must have lived as if they were a member of the opposite sex for at least two years, and they must have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria agreed by two doctors. So under this legislation already in place, a man in his 50s who has fathered children can be issued with a birth certificate stating that he was born female. Now that is bad enough, uh, but it grieves me to tell you this evening that three days before Christmas, the Parliament, the Assembly in my native Scotland voted in favour of new legislation to allow 16-year-olds to change legal sex simply by self-declaration without any medical diagnosis. Members of the Scottish Parliament voted overwhelmingly by 86 votes to 39 to approve the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Act and as well as allowing 16 and 17 year olds to change legal sex, the measure there in Scotland has cut the waiting time from two years to just three months. And obviously that has very serious implications for safe spaces, for women, for well-being, for teenagers, 16 and 17 year olds and younger. And you may be saying, well, why am I mentioning what's happening in Scotland? What relevance uh, does it have to us here in Lisburn tonight? Well, sadly, despite the genuine concerns about the impact of gender self-identification on safe spaces for women and girls, there are leading politicians here in Northern Ireland calling for us to adopt the same measures that have been enacted in Scotland. The former finance minister at Stormont, Conor Murphy, MLA, commissioned research into the gender recognition laws here in Northern Ireland. His final report was published in December and it favoured a policy of gender self-identification here. Uh, he was not the only voice calling for this to be adopted. In a debate in Westminster, Dr. Stephen Farry, the deputy leader of the Alliance Party, said that people who describe themselves as transgender must have their chosen identity accepted without question. And when the Scottish Parliament passed that bill in December, Dr. Farry said on Twitter, well done, Scotland. Now the rest of the UK, including Northern Ireland, needs to follow. And his comments were endorsed by his colleague, Paula Bradshaw, MLA, who wrote uh, that the Scottish Parliament is leading the way on social justice. It's so important we get up to pace with them ASAP. And the SDLP representative, Councillor Seamus Defoy, uh, said on social media that the Scottish Bill was huge progress for trans lives and rights, and it was deeply unfair that Northern Ireland has not introduced gender self-identification. And meanwhile, the Green Party here in Ireland has called for children of any age to be allowed to change their gender. So there are many voices calling for 
these measures to be introduced here. But the impact of gender ideology on children and young people is greatly increasing. In the year 2009 to 2010, the Tavistock Clinic, one of the main facilities treating teenagers in this matter with hormone treatment, puberty blocking drugs, it received 77 referrals from teenagers. In 2019 to 2020, 10 years later, the figure was 2,728. Many people are concerned that this trend is being driven by social influences, especially online influences. Teenagers who are going through fairly common adolescent struggles are being encouraged to think about themselves as transgender. And a number of organizations have prepared briefings on this. My own organization, the Christian Institute, has prepared flyers on this very issue. There's a table in the foyer. You can take copies of those briefings. Uh, and the Family Education Trust also produces briefings, and Lucy Marsh will be speaking about that later on. But every year now, hundreds of gender-confused children, including here in Northern Ireland and in the south of Ireland too, are being put on courses of puberty-blocking drugs. The drugs are being described as a living experiment with largely unknown long-term consequences, but we do know that they affect bone density, they affect fertility, and they possibly affect brain development. And what's more, in up to 90% of cases, childhood confusion about gender resolves by itself by the end of puberty, but puberty is the very process the drugs are blocking. So almost all of the children taking those blockers go on to receive more damaging hormone treatment. So we need to be clear about how to answer those challenges, particularly those who are involved in teaching and those who are involved in working with young people. Yes, we must deal with people graciously, but we must also deal with them truthfully. And it is true that no amount of surgery and no amount of hormone injections can turn a man into a woman or a woman into a man. To still have XX or XY chromosomes and no amount of surgery and no amount of hormone injections can change that. But we are, have seen politicians even here calling for those things to be brought into law and to be taught to our children in schools. There's a growing number of people who undergo those medical interventions and then live to regret them. These people are being called detransitioners because they undergo gender reassignment surgery and hormone treatment and then regret that decision. One day transitioner told Sky News she's heard from hundreds of people expressing regret for having gone down this line. But of course, some of the treatment is irreversible. So people are being left in desperately sad situations where they've done major damage to their physical body. Well, I think that shows to us the harrowing reality of the trans agenda, the thought that that should be taught to children in schools and promote to them as an option is deeply, deeply concerning. Uh, when we see the articles from the papers today and yesterday on the Human Rights Commission's recommendations that this be taught in schools and we hear uh, politicians such as Connie Egan want to encourage us to respond uh, to protect our children in what they're taught in the classroom. Uh, but I have been asked by Mary Russell to say one or two things about what we can do. Some of these have been touched on and the key emphasis is that parents are the first and the primary educators of their own children. So the children are not property of the state. Children are the responsibility of their parents uh, and therefore teaching them values in relation to sex education is the role of the parents. It's not the role of the government. It's not the role of the Human Rights Commission despite what might be being presented at the moment or if any other quangle or public body. But as said, uh, a, a few things you can do is, if your children are in school, you can ask what materials, what books are being used, as Lucy's highlighted, what outside organizations are coming into schools. Even here in Northern Ireland, uh, there are certain outside organizations coming in, Cara Friend, Rainbow Project. Parents sometimes are not au fait with what these might be teaching or what perspective they might be coming from. There's opportunities to join school governing bodies, to meet with head teachers. Uh, there are opportunities to raise these concerns with politicians and others, to write 
to local newspapers to expose what's going on, to garner around you other concerned parents, to make use of resources that are given. I, the Christian Institute has a literature table here at the side as well, with briefings particularly on the trans issue, and schools do help yourself to them. The Christian Institute sends updates to people, uh, usually on a Friday afternoon, on those issues. So if you want to get the free updates, you can pop your name and address on one of these cards, and there's a basket beside it with pens. Drop the card in the basket, and you can get the updates. Uh, but also, there is the ultimate opportunity of withdrawing your children uh, from such lessons, and that uh, opportunity still exists here in Northern Ireland. So if it's necessary, then parents should avail of it, because we are responsible for what we let our children be taught. Um, also speak to the politicians on this issue as well. As I've mentioned uh, in opening, the trans agenda is being promoted. Children are being taught uh, very unscientifically that uh, men can become women, women could, can become men, and yet people are calling for evidence-based sex education scientifically back sex education, and yet they're wanting to tell them uh, that they can change their gender. Well, it's not actually possible, uh, as we have already uh, considered.